Uh, on behalf of Women in Business, I just wanted to welcome everybody today. Um, my name is Claire Gallagher. I am Head of Membership for Women in Business. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, be joined here today by Keith Lippert as All States Vice President, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer, um, who will be giving us our webinar today on achieving executive presence. But before we get started with Keith, um, I just wanted to let everybody know what we are doing today um, with regards to uh, our schedule of events that we've got coming up for Women in Business. Um, so you'll just see a few that we've coming up in the weeks ahead. Um, on on the 16th of February, we actually have um, Little Penny Thoughts, um, or who are undertaking the webinar, Positive Thinking with Little Penny Thoughts. So it'd be absolutely fantastic opportunity to listen there in. Um, we also have our um, evening with Women in Cult Agriculture coming up on the 23rd of February. This is a great opportunity for anybody within the industry. They were going to listen to diversity um, within uh, women in the agriculture, diversifying through COVID and Brexit. So it's a really interesting opportunity to listen into that. Um, we also have on the 25th of February, uh, the future of tech. And that is going to be a webinar hosted by Queen's University Management School. Um, and then on the 4th of March coming up, there will be our Entrepreneurs Round Table. And this is a great opportunity for women who have their own business, they're setting up their own business for entrepreneurs to really um, discuss, network, um, and benchmark and, 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 and catch up on maybe discussions that they maybe want to look at or, or how they're doing within their business. So um, lots of events coming up, um, all of the schedule and you can book through our website. Um, and it's a great chance for everybody to, to get on to some of our future webinars. So um, uh, the next um, exciting opportunity that we have, if we get for our next slide coming up, is our Women in Business Inspiring Women Awards. So this is a great opportunity for you. If you know a remarkable woman, completely deserves recognition in all the achievements of 2020. So we have a number of um, categories. For everybody there is there's a person of purpose we have a mentor of the year the agent of change we actually have also a generosity of spirit award and a woman of the year award so please do go on to our website and have a look at the nominations and start nominating some amazing women within your business or within your community um, it's a great opportunity for you to do so so that's really what women in business have uh, coming up um, and without further ado, um, I would love to introduce Keith. Um, and as I said, Keith is uh, Allstate's Vice President and Deputy Chief Information Security Officer. If I've got that right there, Keith. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> that's it. Um, so um, really, really excited and looking forward to hearing from you today. So over to you, Keith. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to this audience. I. Uh, I remember it was almost exactly a year ago that I had the opportunity to, to talk at one of these events about resilience, and it was just before we went into lockdown. So it's great to be back. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, a topic that I'm passionate about. Um, you know, for me, uh, I, I asked for a, a short introduction because I think for me, this becomes part of the story and part of my story. Um, you know, if we can uh, go to the career slide there. I, um, I began my career um, <laughs> right at university. I'm sure my, my parents were incredibly thrilled to see me uh, majoring in art history uh, with a specialty in signs and symbols and religious paintings. Uh, they probably wondered if I'd ever get a paying job, um, but I did. And uh, near the end of my university career, uh, I started my first job in banking um, as a bill collector. Uh, it was the lowest job uh, in the bank, and as you might expect, not necessarily the most uh, glamorous job uh, being a bill collector. Um, but immediately coming into the work environment from academics, I could see those people that I admired, uh, that I wanted to follow, those people who were sort of uh, bigger than life and had uh, like a big personality. And... Um, you know, I was quite curious about that. And uh, even before I got my first job in leadership, uh, there was something there that I wanted to learn more about. They had this executive presence and in, in, in early in my career, there was somebody in the bank who I really admired and he was a really big personality. 
And I remember asking uh, my boss at the time about this and uh, about, you know, how to gain executive presence. And he was not particularly helpful. He said, you know, it's just something you're born with. <laughs> and, you know, that uh, didn't satisfy me. And um, throughout my career, it's been something that has been a pursuit for me. So I, I worked for that bank in America for uh, almost 20 years, exactly to the day, actually. And um, worked way, my way up from being a bill collector to being on their board. Um, so uh, I was uh, their first information security officer for that bank and uh, had uh, an office with mahogany in it and a, a parking spot with my name on it. And uh, I had done pretty well for myself. And, um, you know, I think in anyone's career, there are those opportunities where you you have a chance to do something extraordinary or to take a, a safe route. And I was contacted by Barclays Bank in London who uh, had suffered some sanctions violations. They had done business uh, with people, uh, known terrorists they shouldn't have. They were being fined by the US government uh, $800 million. And I was recruited to come uh, fix the problem. As you might expect, that was a big jumping off point for me in my career, uh, single country, single currency uh, that I had been in uh, for 20 years, uh, moving out of the United States for the first time, uh, a very complex uh, bank, uh, 128 currencies in 59 countries. And uh, I felt like it was um, one of those times in my career where I, I, I had this internal voice saying, uh, I don't think I can do this. And uh, the guy who I really admired, who had huge executive presence telling me, well, why couldn't you do it? And I, there was a, a flip that needed to switch in my brain to start thinking in that way. Of, you know, why, why couldn't I do it? If I could be successful in one country, why couldn't I be successful in, a, in 59? <laughs> so I did take that opportunity. Uh, I came over on a two-year visa and thought, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll be back in America in two years. Uh, I came over and I became uh, Barclays uh, legal chief operating officer. Uh, so I had uh, responsibility for all, all anti-terrorism controls, money laundering, politically exposed person screening. And as you might expect, I learned a great deal about uh, executive presence uh, from that position, um, both good and bad behaviors I saw uh, in that bank. And, um, but it did uh, create on the side note, this fascination with financial crime. And uh, the one financial crime that I didn't have at that uh, bank was fraud. And I always had a fascination for fraud and wanted to get that uh, sort of last uh, card in my resume. So uh, when American Express approached me about uh, running uh, fraud prevention from them uh, globally, uh, so it was 39 countries, and it was could be the biggest team I had ever had in my career. It was a uh, thousand people. Um, again, thinking back to the topic, you can see how that would require a certain amount of executive presence uh, to, to lead a team that large over that many countries. And it allowed me to stay in the UK, which I was really enjoying. Um, and during that time, I, I met a, a young lady from uh, Northern Ireland and fell in love and got married and uh, ended up in Belfast, uh, which is sort of the end of the story. But uh, so, you know, when you think about uh, having uh, a thousand people. Um, it meant that I had people who had people who had people and leaders of leaders. And that required a little bit different approach to executive presence. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I ended my career at that uh, organization running their banks. Um, so I was chairman of a bank in Russia, uh, chairman of a bank in India, uh, Mexico and Canada which in some ways was my dream job, but I had this boss who was uh, absolutely toxic. And again, there were some things that I could learn and share from uh, with all of you about that experience. Um, I, uh, through coming over to Northern Ireland on holiday with my wife uh, to see my in-laws, uh, saw the Allstate sign and uh, they were kind enough to allow me to do a job uh, rather than doing it stateside because they're an American company. They allowed me to do it from here. And uh, almost immediately, I became involved with uh, women in business. I saw the diversity in my team, which uh, I wasn't particularly proud of. Um, IT doesn't uh, have great diversity, and IT security is even worse. Um, so uh, 
I wanted to hear from diverse backgrounds and be protected from diverse risks. So uh, I almost immediately uh, approached Rosanne about joining the Board of Women in Business, and I've been thrilled to be a part of this organization uh, ever since. So um, I'd love to talk to you today and make this interactive. I, I prefer face-to-face -face interactions, but this is the way we have to do it for now. So I'd love for you to use the chat. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, it's down in the bottom uh, near the center. And I'd love for you to tell me some of the words that come to your mind when you think of executive presence. What are those traits that you would uh, see people having when you think about executive presence? And I'll give you a couple of seconds to throw those into the chat. So confidence, authority, leadership, strength. I saw a male dominated in there too, and I wanna talk about that as well. Power, knowledge, well-spoken, that's brilliant. Empathy, fantastic. So we're not gonna do a, a word map today, but if you advance to the next slide, you've, you've touched on a lot of the things that I think are important. So um, you'll see many of those words that uh, you, you listed there. Uh, gravitas is one that uh, we're going to get into deeper in the presentation. So having command of an audience, right? Um, projecting that aura uh, of confidence um, and creating trust uh, that you find that people who have high uh, executive presence are sort of those people that immediately create that uh, immense trust across uh, uh, all demographics, right? That it's sort of universal. And um, I do want to talk, and you'll see in the slide presentation later, uh, about how uh, executive presence might be viewed differently uh, in both men and women. And there's some good data that I'm going to share from Gardner on that about what traits are most important uh, and some of the math behind it. Uh, not necessarily my personal opinions, but it's based on good data. So if you could advance to the next slide, um, there are like some traits that you see, like I, I think you would agree as you look across those uh, people that um, these are people that uh, have strong executive presence. Now the the one in the lower right hand corner, I, I said, uh, you know, when I first did this presentation, I've been doing this presentation in America for a while, but I was like, I need somebody who's a local personality, who's not going to be hated by any political party or any demographic. And and that was what, what our intern came up with. So, um, but I think you would ag agree that all of the people on that slide have a big personality, right? They have gravitas. But again, I wasn't satisfied by this. You know, when, I, when people told me these terms, I felt like they were still a little woolly and I wanted to define it a bit further because I think that these are not traits that you're born with. They are things that you can learn over time and turn up in your personality. So if you go to the next slide, this is how I, I, I break this down, that uh, the commonly expressed elements of executive presence are gravitas, communication, and appearance. And we'll talk, uh, we'll break these down each a little bit further, but this is a, a great way to sort of begin defining what it means to have executive presence. The first of which I'm gonna to touch on is energy. And by energy, I don't mean extrovert. So uh, I think I've taken maybe six or eight Myers-Briggs tests in my career, and I always test introverted. Uh, I believe that I am an introvert. Um, and for me, the, the primary difference between an introvert and an extrovert is where you get your energy from. So uh, if an extrovert is on stage behind the podium giving a big presentation, they will come off of stage buzzing. You know, they will you know, gain energy from the audience. Whereas I expect to be depleted. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that I can't express the same energy as an extrovert. Uh, I just expect that uh, when I, I leave it all on stage, you know, I'm gonna be depleted. So uh, energy, confidence and charisma are some of the things that uh, are the beginning of definition of uh, gravitas. Then you go into the relational elements. Um, so we used to teach this at the bank as sort of the human business model. Those people who have high gravitas and, and high executive presence uh, begin interactions on the human level. Hi, how are you doing? How was your weekend, right? And then they transition to business. Uh, need to get a report from you, 
um, uh, maybe your child was sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, they're very um, empathetic and they go back to the human level. And you find that they bounce back and forth between the human level and the business level in, uh, in human interactions and they begin and end on the human level. And I'm sure we've all run into people who spend too much time on the human level and never get anything done. People who spend too much time on the business level and they sound robotic or like they don't care. So those relationship elements are important to uh, understanding what your emotional uh, intelligence is, that ability to read the room, to read the person, know when you need to transition uh, from the human level back to the business level. And the people who are really slick at doing it, you never know this is happening, right? It just is uh, maybe second nature to them, or maybe they were born with it, but it's certainly something that you can learn. The next thing is sort of the clarity of uh, voice. Uh, and that doesn't mean necessarily that they have a big booming uh, male voice. It's that they have clarity and strong message. It is about the messaging and how they formulate their message. Um, I like to use Winston Churchill with this example. You know, I, I, I've read that uh, he used about 400 words in his speeches. So it was something that everyone could connect with. Uh, and he uses a lot of metaphors, the things that people can uh, relate to in their life. So when we talk about clarity and strong message, it isn't necessarily that they have a big booming personality, but it's something that everyone connect, uh, can connect with. Okay, let's break it down a little further here. So on the next slide, character, substance, and style. Uh, again, sticking with these three verticals. Um, the first one is authentic, and you can see this right away. Uh, I, I'm sure you deal with people or you see people uh, on TV, politician, politicians, etc., and you can immediately tell that authenticity, uh, whether it's there or not. And these are sort of on a scale between really there and really not there. It's the person who can live inside their skin. So. You know, when I look at uh, an executive that I admire, who has traits that I admire, uh, there are certain things that I can use myself uh, that would be authentic to me and other things that just simply wouldn't be. So I think as you're thinking about how to improve your executive presence or how to dial up some of these knobs, um, look for those people that you admire and uh, see if the traits fit your skin, you know, it's got to be authentic. Uh, it has to be true to who I am. The next thing that I think is important is that uh, you show your values. So when you look at uh, a career history like mine, you can see how important integrity would be to me, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, sanctions, money laundering, uh, uh, anti-terrorism controls, fraud. You know, there wasn't a week that was going by that we weren't putting someone in handcuffs uh, when I was working at American Express. So you can see how my values uh, became part of my story and part of my executive presence. So that's true today when you think about cybersecurity as well. You know, I view it as uh, something that we do for society. Uh, that uh, no different than a doctor or nurse, that I want to ensure that uh, we protect your data uh, as well as your your person, right? Uh, so this is something we that uh, I think is linked back to society, and you find that people who have strong executive presence show their values. Um, we were talking before we came online about uh, my daughter, who's five years old, being very curious about uh, the webinar today and what I was doing from our back bedroom. And uh, it's not uncommon for me to bring my daughter onto a Zoom call with my team and uh, show the values that I am more than just the person who works at Allstate. I'm a father and I am a husband and those are part of my values. Uh, and it's, it's important and I think that grows your executive presence. The next one I wanna talk about is restraint. Um, and this is not about not showing emotion. In fact, in, in the world of Zoom and where we're not as physically connected as we used to be, um, you know, I think it's important that people see that you are very happy when you're very happy with them as a leader. So if you have a team and you're happy with their performance, I think I find that I almost have to be more descriptive about the emotion so that they understand just how happy I am. 
uh, and uh, that uh, because they're not immediately connected with me face to face, that I have to do, do a bit more in a telepresence world uh, to describe how happy I am. The same holds true when I'm not particularly pleased that I need to be as descriptive about that because we don't have those face-to-face -face interactions where you can see a lot of the communication elements that go along with your your voice, your tone, your cadence. Uh, you, you, it's a little bit flatter in the world of telepresence. So you almost have to uh, dial that piece up in, when you're in a remote world. Um, what this really is talking about is that uh, if you fly off the handle, right? So the sort of people that um, are erratic in their behaviors uh, that will erode executive presence and the people who are um, <clears throat> sort of cool under pressure, uh, that's what we're talking about when we say restrained. The next one, and, and you can see this in my story and I hope it comes through in, in, in the way that you see me on screen today is the humble. Um, you know, I, I remember very well what it was like to be in the lowest job in that bank. Um, and the day I was hired there, I was given an, an ID to access a, a mainframe system. And my ID was L585637. And I remember it to this day because I, I still think of myself uh, as that bill collector working uh, in the depths of a bill collection department and people didn't necessarily listen to me, didn't care about my thoughts, ideas, and opinions. And I just never want anyone in my organization, no matter where I am, to feel that way. Um, so I think that becomes a part of uh, your executive presence and part of your character that you want to uh, bring across. Um, at American Express, I'll never forget my, my first trip uh, to see my team in Malaysia. So I had about uh, 250 people in Malaysia and traveling from London to Malaysia, which is a long trip. So there was a lot of planning that went into it. And I hit the ground there at the office and, uh, you know, they told me how excited they were to that uh, a senior leader was coming to visit them. And I was like, oh, that's great. I can't wait to meet them. Uh, thinking somebody else had planned a trip the same week and it, it was me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think it's true to my, my, uh, my core that I, I am indeed humble. And I think that's an important character when we think about those faces that I've displayed up there, the uh, Oprah's or John F. Kennedy or Merkel, uh, there is a level of uh, humbleness in them uh, and where they began in their careers. Um, and then during that same trip, uh, I wanted to go back and I, you know, I had been traveling a long time and we had a, a dinner out uh, because they like to wine and dine you. Uh, and um, I wanted to go back and see the night shift. And I don't think they expected that. And I think they were quite surprised that I wanted to go in and see the people who were working uh, overnight uh, servicing our customers and sit uh, with somebody and listen to some phone calls. Um, but it was important to me and it was uh, it's true to my character and to my core. So that's a little bit about character. I'm gonna to touch on substance next because really I think it's the most important thing. As you look across those three uh, verticals, character, substance, and style, uh, it's really about what you're saying, right? Uh, the practical will, wisdom. And my boss is somebody who is absolutely a master of this. So he has to talk to our board about really complex cybersecurity matters in a way that they can understand. Sometimes he uses ice cream and flavors of ice cream to describe it. Sometimes he talks about a kitchen with ingredients and all the ingredients are safe and you can't bring other ingredients into the kitchen. Um, so he uses a real practical wisdom uh, that I really admire. Um, so, you know, if, if you look particularly in that vertical, I think these are the things that you want to test or if you're going to spend time on yourself, substance is the most important thing. Right. Uh, another study I read uh, had a quote that said executive presence is those people who are willing to step into the spotlight and have something to say. And this is where substance comes in. We all too often are sitting in a meeting and that person you're sitting next to whispers something to you that's brilliant. Right. They didn't step into the spotlight. Uh, and then you also have those people who get it wrong the other direction who step in the spotlight and ramble on. Um, didn't really have anything to say. 
So I think, you know, in the back of your mind, uh, substance is about those people who are willing to step into the spotlight and have something to say. They're self-assured, they're calm, uh, they have a resonance uh, and they have vision. You know, they can connect the dots for you. Martin Luther King did not have a 10 step program. He had a dream. And I think that created a vision that people could get behind when there were many civil rights leaders uh, working on the same problem. But uh, because he could create a vision, he really came to the top. Lastly, uh, I'll talk about style. Um, there is, I think, something about looking the part. Uh, and that's very difficult to define. So I'll, I'll talk a little more about that in a second. But, um, you know, uh, there, there is an unwritten uniform uh, for most uh, businesses. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that's viewed across all parts of leadership here in a second. And uh, the other elements that fall under style of welcoming of diverse points of view. And certainly if you can imagine having a team of uh, a thousand people in 23 countries, um, you have to get really comfortable really quick with there being more than one right solution. <laughs> that uh, your idea may not be the, uh, the only right answer to the problem. Uh, so uh, looking for that diversity and diversity, not just in your teams, but in their points of view, I think both are important. And there's an, a level of uh, assertiveness, which is different than aggressiveness, right? That uh, they're there for you. Um, and they're passionate that that energy comes across in their character. But you can see how this slide sort of creates a nice scoring mechanism for yourself where you can sort of rate yourself across each of these verticals and where you want, would want to improve. Okay. The next slide shows some of the data that I was talking about. So this is uh, from Gardner. And I, I think this is really quite interesting in the, um, in the socially distanced world we're in now where um, when you think about the, this is about the most important aspects of executive presence. On the left-hand side, uh, this is what you want in leaders and on the right-hand side in those top executives. So this is uh, people who are in the first two levels of an organization. So a couple of things that stand out right away. Um, it is, uh, you can see the, the just how important gravitas is um, and how that links to communication. So you can see right away the challenges when you don't get face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with people, um, how that gravitas can come across a bit flat. Um, so you almost need to tune that up more in a remote world because it is the biggest component, whether you're in leadership or whether you're in cedar leadership, that's you know 62 to 67 percent of what's important to the audience. Um, you also notice the the interesting uh, part of around appearance that uh, you know if you're at the top of the shop uh, and you're Steve Jobs, you can wear the black turtleneck. Uh, it's not as important that you'd be suited and booted. Um, but uh, I, I think this is quite interesting. And again. Uh, why I want to spend some time talking about Gravitas because it is uh, maybe one of the most important components. In the next slide, you see how that breaks out. So um, two things, and, and I want to thank the person who is transparent in the chat and talked about the differences between uh, men and women and, and, and how sometimes at the top of the sea level of the shop, it's not 50-50 yet. Um, so let's talk about Gravitas and break it down into its components. The first one is, uh, again, these are the elements that uh, you want to have and, and are, uh, for me, a better definition of what gravitas means when you're thinking about an executive. And again, when you think about the people that you admire, the leaders that you admire, I think you can see how they have these traits, right? So beginning on the left, uh, that grace under fire. Um, and this is, again, um, where we're not talking, uh, we're talking about people uh, not flying off the handle. Uh, and uh, if you're in the audience and uh, you're, you're a woman, you can see how that's something that's, uh, that we want to see more of in our female leaders is that grace under fire. Um, when it comes to decisiveness about even, integrity, emotional intelligence, uh, clearly important, uh, reputation and pedigree. This is, you know, sort of um, where did you come from? Tell me about your, your people, your, your, 
you know, what's your degree and your background, and then vision. Um, so when uh, I like this slide because it, it uh, I think, again, tries to take something that can be nebulous and woolly like gra gravitas and puts it into terms that I think are well defined. Okay. The next slide is a bit of, you know, what is it and what it, is, what it isn't, because like anything in your personality, if you turn it up too high, it, be, it can become, uh, go from strength to weakness. So uh, again, this is someone who's willing to step into the spotlight and has something to say, uses metaphor as well, um, uses imagery well. Uh, like Martin Luther King, uh, he didn't have a 10 step program, he had a dream. I had the opportunity two years ago to meet uh, Alan Mulally, uh, and Alan uh, was the CEO, uh, the global CEO of Ford Motor Company. Um, and when you think about the, the the company that he took over, I think they they were losing four, 14 or 17 billion dollars uh, when he took over the top job at uh, at um, Ford. He was faced with numerous issues, but uh, Meeting Alan, he really did all of those things that we defined in that first slide. I couldn't believe how quickly he owned that room, uh, how quickly I was bought into his story, uh, how he used just simple language to describe uh, what it was like to run that massive global organization. And he was really the inventor of that strategy, which would became their marketing uh, slogan, which was quality is job one. And you may remember that in their advertising uh, that it didn't matter what you did at Ford, quality is job one. And that was his vision that everyone could get behind. It didn't matter whether you were an accountant or whether you put uh, bolts on screws. Uh, whether you uh, painted cars or marketed cars, quality is job one. And it was that thing that uh, everyone could get behind. Uh, clearly he had this um, amazing uh, intellectual, uh, emotional intelligence and ability to read a room, um, confidence, he was decisive. But uh, for somebody who ran Boeing uh, before that and had designed every cockpit of every Boeing aircraft uh, going back to the 1970s, ran Ford. He didn't have an inflated ego. He was someone who you would sit down with and have a casual conversation. Clearly, he was a strong personality, but he was not bullying. Uh, you could see in just that hour I got to spend with him, just uh, his integrity, um, and his respect and uh, the depth that he could go to. Uh, another thing that I think is important in executive presence is those people who are not just superficial, right? He was able to talk at a detailed level about engineering problems and the ability to speak at uh, multiple levels in the organization really, really raised his executive presence and his gravitas. Um, he has a book out there uh, if you'd like to read it, uh, but uh, it's about Ford Motor Company, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But he was a great example for me of what Gravitas is and isn't. Uh, he could have been a huge ego. He could have been bullying and all of those things, but he was a very, very down to earth person, lived true to his values, and that made him very human. Okay. Next, I want to talk about um, body language. And again, something that's really tough when you only see uh, this much of a person right now, uh, but uh, it, it is important. Uh, it is uh, something that I think about, you know, before we came online, I was taking a look at my camera angle. You know, was it, uh, was it good lighting? Could you see my facial expressions? Um, you know, is my chin up? Um, I read a book recently called the, the Culture Code about high-performing cultures. And, and in there, they talk about having that open face that um, you can see almost immediately when you come online with someone. And it, it doesn't do a great job of explaining. It's one of those things where you sort of know it when you see it. But having that open face uh, when you're on a Zoom call or in a meeting uh, is important so that you're welcoming. And uh, that creates that executive presence, will raise your executive presence. That person who's closed and shut down uh, is not the person you're gonna walk over and wanna talk to. Um, I also, uh, 
you'll, you saw maybe in my bio that I, I went to London Business School and there was a teacher there who taught influencing. Uh, uh, psychologist, uh, one of those person, people you'd hate to be married to because I think he'd probably win every argument. He was really influential. But he always said that when you're face to face, to look at people's feet. And I thought it was funny, I, you know, but uh, when, you're, when you're engaged with people, their feet are pointing towards you. Um, when the person is less engaged or you're not as engaged as a leader, one of those feet starts to cock out a little bit, like they're trying to get away. Um, so a key thing when you're a leader and you're in a face-to-face -face event, you want to raise your executive presence, point your feet towards the person or towards the audience. That foot that's pointing out is a visual cue that you want to get away, that you want to escape. So um, in, in here, we don't have time today to go into it very far, but uh, Amy Cuddy is fantastic at talking about body language. She has a number of YouTube videos where she goes into more depth about this. Again, in a in a um, Zoom related world, I think it's more important that you make that eye contact. Very easy to look at your screen rather than the camera, which means your eyes are off a little bit. Um, but uh, wherever you can, uh, make sure that uh, you are thinking about the, that body language that you have on Zoom because it's uh, equally important. Okay. Next, we're going to go back into communication a little bit about what is uh, good communication and, and what's not got good communication. Um, I got the impression uh, immediately from Alan uh, Mullally and the way that he used pauses that he was a, a fantastic listener, right? When, again, when you think about an organization like Ford Motor Company um, and all of the different challenges you might have with suppliers and all of those things. Being a good listener and being able to uh, diagnose the problem, what people are telling you uh, overtly and covertly is important and that's part of EQ, right? Um, so superior sk speaking skills, that means having command of the room, even when it's a virtual room. Uh, assertiveness, but not talking over people. Uh, the ability to listen, and that's really important. Uh, and I'll go back to what I said before about the, the both the overt and the covert message. Um, I like the uh, Six Sigma rule of uh, keep asking why until you get to the point where you understand the, the root cause. Uh, a well-timed sense of humor um, is important. And I think the, that's the wording in this slide is perfect. It, it's well-timed. Um, it can be disarming, it can be charming, it can be endearing, and when you get it wrong, it's misplaced and inappropriate. So I think this is a place where you do have to use a bit of EQ to understand um, how humor works with the audience, how it works with you and your personality. Again, it's something that uh, you can try the skill on. If you have somebody who you really admire, who you think uses humor well to be disarming, to make that transition from the human level to the business level, which is also important in our interactions, then, then try it on and see if it works for you. Um, for me, there's a comedian in the United States named David Colbert who I really admire this. He's, he's a brilliant guy and he has a sense of humor that uh, I try on from time to time to see if it works for me. Um, so I think uh, it is important. It can be disarming, it can be charming, uh, but sort of read your audience and get feedback um, afterwards and make sure that it was appropriate. The other th good thing, uh, the other thing about uh, communication that I think is important is that we have this sort of formula that we use when we're dealing with senior executives. And that formula is really quite simple. Uh, we tell them what we're going to tell them, then we tell them, then we tell them what we told them. And that ends up being sort of a nice formula for how to uh, explain complex things uh, to your audience. If you have to go to a larger and larger audiences, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, then I talk about it, and then I tell you what I told you. Um, again, uh, you can see on this slide how if you turn those knobs up too far, uh, you want to use simple language. But if you're not using simple language, it's going to become rambling, rambling or redundant. Uh, people who are not making good eye contact, you sort of wonder if they're distracted or being disingenuous. Um, 
you know, it's it's really hard, I think, sometimes to see people watching uh, that over-reliance on notes. I can read a slide. You don't need to read it to me. Um, that will erode your executive presence. Uh, that lack of focus or, or boredom, you know, certainly you can see that in, in Zoom calls as well as face-to-face. -face. So these are common across all, all mediums. Next thing, and this is this is painful. I think this is where you, you need to get help sometimes is eliminating those filler words. Um, whether, that was one right there, by the way. Whether it's a uh, face-to-face or in a Zoom call, uh, certainly the use of those filler words will erode your executive presence. Um, there is somebody who works for me who is absolutely one of the top minds in the world when it comes to his science. And sometimes he begins sentence with, I guess. And um, it, it was, I think, affecting his executive presence. You know, I, I don't want my uh, expert guessing. I want him knowing. Uh, so this is something where, you know, if you can partner with somebody that you know and trust and say, hey, ob observe me du during this presentation, observe me during this meeting, and if you could help me watch for those filler words because they do come into your language without thinking about it. Uh, it could be people who say like. I find that a lot with Americans. Um, you know, one of the triggers for me is uh, people who say, well, to tell you the truth, I think to myself, you weren't telling me the truth prior to that, um, basically. Uh, so, you know, be conscious of the filler words that you use. And the best way to do that, I think, is to get some feedback and have somebody tick on a piece of paper how many times you use the filler word, um, because those will uh, erode your executive presence. Those will become the thing that uh, can be distracting to the audience. Okay. Next, I'll talk about appearance. And uh, I do have a funny story about this. So I, I started at uh, Barclays, which is that 400-year-old uh, British bank. And as you might expect, they had rigor, um, being a 400-year-old British bank. And I remember sitting down with my boss the first day, and he looked me up and down, and he said, right, uh, Keith, he said, suits. Suits are black. They're blue or they're gray. Shirts are white. They can be blue if you're on telepresence. Ties need to be Hermes or Ferragamo. You can have your jacket off if you're at your desk, but if you're away from your desk, you have your jacket on. Shoes can be wingtip or uh, cap toe, but they've got to be lace up, no loafers. Loafers are for loafers. And that was a very well-defined uniform. Right, uh, I knew what the expectations were from that moment forward. Uh, but uh, this is a place where you really sort of, sort of have to take a look at the unwritten rules. So uh, we had somebody recently uh, for a, a boss, uh, my, my boss is the CIO at the top layer, and somebody came to the meeting with him uh, with a baseball cap on. And I thought, gee, that's brave. Um, so, you know, I think I'd certainly talk to your team about setting some guidelines. You know, what are what are the guidelines for when we use our cameras? What are the guidelines for how we will uh, appear in face-to-face -face meetings, external clients, internal clients, um, those meetings where you want to impress? You know, I think it's always a little bit difficult too when you're like doing an internal interview. So I'm interviewing for a job in the company that I work for. I don't wear a suit every day. Do I wear a suit to the interview? Um, some of those are become the unwritten rules. I think for me, you know, it becomes part of your brand. Uh, you know, that for me, I, I wear suits and that's part of my personal brand. And it's, it's not an ego thing. Uh, the way I think of it is I, I want to be a good represent, representation for my team. I want them to be proud of me when I represent them externally. And for me, my appearance is part of that. Uh, so, you know, I think of it sort of as an investment in myself, very much like a, a book I would read or a, a class I would go to. So, you know, I think sort of keep keep an eye on what's happening and what the written or unwritten rules are in your environment. I think when you look at that first slide and those people who are suited and booted there, uh, you can see how executive presence uh, does have a, a level of polish in their personal experience as well. That Gardner data shows that also. Um, that uh, appearance is a portion, uh, unless you're at the sea level, and then you can wear the khakis uh, and the uh, roll neck turtleneck. 
Um, but, um, you know, I think it is a key part of what you want to take a look at and appearance is not just what you wear, but also then uh, your your posture and those Amy uh, Cuddy videos, I think are good uh, at, um, at, at some some tips and tricks. The next slide is one that I'd love for, I, I think we're gonna be sharing the slide pack out because I, I really like this one for uh, self-assessing yourself. So again, this is trying to take something that's really nebulous like executive presence and put it into terms that we can define. Again, you see those quadrants, right? Influencing, engaging, and connection. And then how those uh, go into greater detail into things that we can actually define. So I'd encourage you to think about um, either in a important situation to you or in your career today, how would you score yourself across these uh, categories? Would you say you're red, amber, or green, or um, you know, rank them in, uh, from one to 10, whatever works for you. But I like this as sort of a printable guide to say, what are the things where I feel like I'm doing well? Uh, where would I like to turn up my executive presence or really work on some key skills? Um, it's also something that I think you could use with a, a trusted uh, you know, boss or, or someone that uh, is mentoring you to get their perceptions as well. So you may uh, do a big presentation, score yourself and ask them to score you. But I really like this uh, as a way that um, you can uh, both assess yourself and get some feedback. That is probably the next big topic. So how can you develop uh, executive presence through feedback? And um, if we go to the, the next slide, um, it is both about uh, giving it as well as receiving it. So um, this is a place where I think you can and should pair up, um, you know, get permission to provide feedback. Um, wherever you can, try to be concrete in your observations. There's nothing worse than I know I'm going to come off this, this uh, call and somebody's going to tell me it was good. Uh, or it was great. And I'm the first question out of my mouth is going to be what was great about it? Uh, tell me what worked and what didn't work. Um, so wherever possible, try to get those concrete observations and explain how, uh, how or why you felt the way that you did if you're giving feedback. Um, you know, what, if, if you can try to suggest actions or alternatives, and again, you can use that wheel that we displayed earlier if you're, if you're struggling to um, categorize it. Uh, typically, uh, feedback like that isn't public, uh, so it's private. Um, you know, listen and, and try to give those clarifying questions. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, requesting feedback, um, learn to maximize it. Uh, you know, I, I can't stress how important this is, that th this is about making incremental gains. This is making small changes in things that you do over time. So what I like to do is if I do have an important meeting, if I do have an important presentation, I will go to that person who I trust and I want to get some feedback from, and I will talk to them about it before the event so that they come in prepared, uh, thinking about it before the event ever takes place. That way they're gonna be you know, observing um, what's happening, your behaviors. So uh, I think that the, that's the first thing I do. Secondly, you wanna get it as soon as possible while it's fresh in your mind and in their mind. Uh, I'm going to come off of this, uh, this webinar and while it's fresh in my mind, I will be thinking about the things that I hope landed with you. Uh, I will be thinking about those things where I stumbled on my words. Uh, and so I think it's important uh, to both get and receive that feedback as soon as you can while you're still thinking about how it felt in the moment. Uh, the further you get from in the moment, uh, the more fuzzy I think the, the feedback gets both as a giver and receiver. When you get the feedback, I always ask what else? You know, what else could I have done? Um, you, if you've got that person who you trust and is giving you the feedback, try to really maximize it, get as much as you can out of it. Um, you know, if you, if you hear things like you need to be more strategic, ask, what would that look like? You know, how would that have been different than what I did? Um, and lastly, you know, think of it as a gift. Uh, feedback is a gift. Um, and uh, that's the only way you're going to get better. Okay. So in closing, you know, I think 
the first thing I'd say is identify those people around you who uh, exhibit those role model behaviors uh, inside or outside of your organization. Um, who are those people you admire? What are the skills they use? Could they be authentic to you? Um, use your network to get feedback. Those people, do you trust? Do you feel like it's a safe space? Um, and try not to accept it was great. You know, uh, try to find out what was it that was great. For many of these things, it's like muscle memory. You know, if you played golf once a year, you're never going to be good at it. Uh, but like Tiger Woods hits five or 600 balls a day. Um, this executive presence and practicing those skills, evaluating yourself against those categories, which we can define, um, is how you're going to get better over time. Lastly, if there's one thing that you focus on, I'd make it the substance. Those because there's, there's nothing worse than that person who steps into the spotlight and has nothing to say. So think about the practical, practical wisdom. Think about the confidence, the composure, the reasoning and the vision. Those are the elements of substance, right? Because of the, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than sitting next to that person who has the brilliant idea but doesn't voice it. You know, and you know, if there's one thing I could, leave you with before we go to the questions and answers is that the one product that I can buy nowhere else is your opinion, your expert opinion. Uh, so, you know, that's the only product you offer that I can't buy anywhere else is your opinion. So make sure you voice it. That's the substance vertical, right? The practical wisdom, the confidence, the composure and the vision. That's the place where uh, really I think takes the great leader and makes them really great, the good leader and makes them great. That's probably the column where you want to spend the most time if you really want to impact your, your executive presence. So I hope I've left time for questions and answers. Um, I'd love to have some. And Hi, Kate. Claire. Hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I'm back, I'm back. Thank you so much. Um, that was a Thank fabulous presentation. Me. Absolutely great. And I think we do, we have a few questions here. So uh, let me get started. And everyone, if you do have any questions for Kate, please do add them here into the Q&A and the chat. And we'll, uh, I'm sure Kate will be able to, to get through them all here today. So so let me get started here. There's, there's one that's just come in here and it's just, um, this is a good one. To be an ex executive, have executive presence, do you have to be an expert in your field? For example, it is, is it a disadvantage to spend time in one industry, say eight years in healthcare, sales and marketing, and then move to something completely different, uh, customer set success and cybersecurity? Is that a setback in terms of progressing to leadership roles? I don't think so. Uh, uh, so I, I sometimes joke that I think I was probably the, the worst hire that the Allstate ever made. Uh, I had not worked in information security in 10 years. Uh, I had never worked in insurance. I had never worked in Northern Ireland. I never worked for Allstate in America. Hadn't been in America working for 13 years. So on paper, in some ways, it may have seemed illogical. But uh, I think the more that I, the more senior you get, like if you're an accountant, uh, eventually they're going to say, uh, we want you to lead accountants and you need to give up the science of accounting and take on the science of leadership. The product that I offer is good leadership. You know, I, I need to count on experts in their technical field. I want to make sure I solve problems well. I want to make sure I have a vision. I want to make sure people get good development and coaching and a good leadership experience. The widget that they're producing, I need to know something about that. But it, it uh, and I want to learn over time because, as you've seen in my background, I'm a, I'm a humble sort of guy, and that's important in executive presence too. So I think the the, the simple answer is no. I, I, and in fact, I think that those skills are very transferable. Certainly. Uh, people who are younger in their career are gonna to have to have more agility. At American Express, they were testing those senior leaders' ability to be more agile. So they would lift and drop the guy who ran marketing and say, now you are gonna run our banks uh, because they were testing their agility. Uh, technology is moving faster and faster. There are new competitors in every market. You know, There was never an Uber that was competing with taxis. And um, so 
that agility and the ability to be lift and dropped into one organization into the other and still be successful is a great test and a great uh, sort of uh, way to improve your agility. So I think the simple answer is no. I, I think, uh, you know, that's a test of your agility, which is important. A lot of, because of course, transferable skills case, you know, whenever you are looking at things, right. you can adapt to look at the, um, other avenues. So, um, yeah. so a quick question here now is, um, uh, do you think a disadvantaged background or multicultural environment can affect executive presence? I think certainly, um, you know, spending the first 20 years in America uh, meant that uh, my, my, I had a fairly narrow view of what it took to be successful as an executive. Certainly that jump in my career uh, and learning uh, how to lead people in multiple countries was a big step forward in my growth. Uh, that uh, my one size all, one size fits all approach that worked for most Americans would not work in all cultures. Um, and then also I had some blind spots of my own. You know, I had been lift and dropped into Barclays, and I couldn't distinguish Bark Barclays work culture from British work, work culture because it was the only culture I'd ever experienced. And it wasn't until I moved out of Barclays that I realized then these were Barclays behaviors versus British business behaviors. So, you know, certainly I, I, I think that uh, absolutely that uh, that multicultural experience gave me the opportunity to expand my executive presence in ways that I, I couldn't have had had I stayed in America. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Keith. Um, this is a good question. Is there a particular woman that you have met that had have, has had executive presence? And was there any notable different traits? Hmm. Certainly, you know, um, I, I really do admire uh, Roseanne, who's the CEO uh, of Women in Business. And uh, I'll tell you a couple of things about her that I think give her strong executive presence. She clearly has a vision. Uh, she clearly talks about that vision in a very consistent way. Uh, if you hear her at the board meeting, the terms that she uses to describe what success looked like is the same as if she was talking to an MP or uh, a member of the public. So she has a very consistent message. Uh, she is strongly, she, you can see in her that strong conviction that what she's doing is in line with her personal values. So there, there's much I see in her, like if you get the opportunity to see her speak, uh, that and you start like scoring her in those three verticals, you'll see how she, you know, masters every single one of them. I, ha I have a lot of time for her. Um, and she's not afraid to make the ask, you know, like when it, when it came to asking people to be on the board to give some of their time and energy and effort to things. Um, she, you, you want to please her. You, you know, she is someone you want to follow. And uh, that comes through all of those elements of executive presence, the gravitas that she creates, the trust that she creates for every person in the organization. Absolutely, and I'll definitely second that, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you've experienced it. <laughs> total, total inspiration, absolutely. But um, so I'll just get on to the next question here. Um, is gravitas more a skill that's developed through experience as opposed to learnt? I think it can be learned, uh, absolutely. And, and that's really, I think, the, the, the one thing I hope you take away from this is that uh, it is something that you can observe in others. So those people that you feel have gravitas, those skills, the big personality, those people that you admire, how they do things, try on that trait. You know, it has to be authentic to you. Um, I've had many bosses who I thought were the big personality, uh, that were very extroverted, and it just wouldn't have worked for me. It wouldn't have been true to my values, and you would have seen right through it like a veneer. Um, but there are other things where I think, that's a skill I really admire. I love that phrasing, or that's something that I can do myself. Uh, and you try it on, and it's that process of incremental gains, right? This is not something uh, that is going to show, you know, immediate change. It's sort of small changes over time. Try it on, see if it works for you. Is it authentic? And then get some feedback. Did it land well with the audience? 
Absolutely, that's great, Keith. Because I think so many of us is really, um, you have given us brilliant skills there. You know, you've explained the process, but so much of it is sometimes practice. I always say practice makes permanent from my side of things too. It's just to keep those skills in the forefront of your mind while you are engaging, you know, with your your daily daily tasks primarily. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, practice, practice, practice. You know, certainly coming into this, not having done one of these events in a year, I felt a little rusty. I wish I had practiced a little more. Oh, because you're fine. <laughs> it, is, it is like muscle memory. Uh, you, you know, I have a process I go through before I do one of these things. I needed to do that process. Find the things that work for you. And you're going to do that through trial and error, right? It is uh, like uh, hitting a golf ball. You do it once, uh, once a year and you're never going to be great at it. You got to practice. Absolutely. I'll have another question here for you. Sure. Do you have any advice for young women who want to progress in the workplace, uh, but their age may seem as a negative factor in relation to executive presence? Any advice for them? Well, first of all, you know, um, the component of age, I think, cuts both directions. No. For me, uh, I'm at the point in my career where I worry that people are going to think I'm a dinosaur. I work in technology, uh, and there's always a new technology, right? So, you know, I, I think it, age is one of those things that can cut both directions. And certainly, I would tell you that when I was young in my career, that jump from individual contributor to leader of people was the most difficult one to make. Um, a couple of things that I think were important. Uh, I needed to have examples I could use in an interview that would show that I could lead people, even though they had never given me the opportunity to lead people. So the things you rely on are the mentoring, right? This is how I've mentored people. Uh, they can be examples outside of work. You know, are you doing volunteer work where you're leading organizations? Are you a leader in your church? Are you a leader in an organization, a charity? Those are all things that you can use to help bridge between individual contributor and leader of people. Uh, because you don't want to get to the interview and have them say, tell me about a, an example where you coach someone and it be a year old. Um, you, you want real relevant recent examples. Um, you know, I think age is not a factor. And, and you know, if, if, if you think it is, that's probably not the people you want to work for. You know, uh, if, uh, if they see you as junior because of your age and don't want to listen to you and don't value your opinion, those are the people we should be listening to. We, at American Express, we, we called it uh, reverse mentoring, which was a kind way of saying, uh, teach an old dog new tricks. Um, you know, like we had senior executives who had never used Twitter, right? Uh, they need to value those opinions and thoughts that you have because you have grown up in a different generation. And if they can't see that, then, you know, that may not be the people you want to work for. Yeah, that's good advice, Keith. Absolutely. Um, this question here, how, how do you deal with poor behavior in a boardroom? Have you ever experienced that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, it depends on what type of poor behavior, but, um, you know, I'm a big believer that of uh, sort of doing it immediately, that we need to recognize, as a leader, you need to recognize all behaviors. Uh, the behaviors are that are good, you want to recognize them immediately and as specifically as you can, or they might stop, right? So this is what was good. This is what was good about it. This is why it makes me happy. Again, because I'm in a remote world, I'm going to be really descriptive about why I'm happy. Uh, and make sure that the open face there is there. And um, the same is true, whether it's in the boardroom or in a meeting, right? Uh, people need to be treated with respect and dignity, uh, needs to be recognized immediately. Um, and if I need to, I'll call an end to the meeting. You know, uh, you know sometimes I think uh, you've, you've got to make that hard stop if things are coming off the rails. And that's, uh, to me, a good sign of executive presence. The, Maybe a little bit different example, but um, like in an interview, if you get stuck on a question, you know, I'd much rather have somebody have the guts to say, can we come back to that? I really want to think about that than make up some answer that uh, rambles on, right? Mm -hmm. So I had, it happened to me once and I was so thrown by it uh, where somebody said, you know, I really want to think about that. Can I come back to that? Wow, that's the person you want to work with who is not going to 
uh, make something up. And I think the same holds true in the boardroom. You know, if, if you are put on the spot, if the bad behavior is that you're under attack, um, I want to think about that. Let me come back and I'll give you an answer when I have an answer. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I think there's, if you can try to deal with it immediately, if you need to call it quits, if it's become non-productive, do it. Be the person who does that. Absolutely. Thanks, Keith. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, and a quick question here. Uh, what is your top confidence tip? Hmm. That's a really tough one because I don't feel particularly confident. And maybe that's the thing that is uh, most important is nobody can see what you're feeling inside, right? The, the butterflies that you have um, are inside. And uh, my father's a psychologist and he gave me a piece of advice one time and he said, the chemical that's produced in your brain when you're excited is the same chemical that's produced in your brain when you're nervous. It's how your brain is interpreting that chemical that makes it either excited or nervous. So I've gone through a process of convincing myself that I'm excited. So when it came to the, the mic being hot today, I was deeply excited about this and hoping that I could help some people, you know, with one thing that you could take away and use. And I try to turn nervous into excited because chemically it's the same chemical, right? It's how you're interpreting it. It takes time and practice to master that. But more and more, I've been able to determine it, to interpret it in my career as being excited, not nervous. Brilliant. Thanks, Keith. Um, well, this is, this is great for man. Um, hi, Keith. These are really good tips. I've enjoyed the time uh, to focus on my presence. I especially like that you focus on practicing these skills. I think it's very important for practicing. What advice can you give to, uh, to get cut through to the next level? How can I tell my story to upwards influence? Hmm. Well, um, getting to the next level um, is different in every com company, right? So like, uh, I wanna make sure I, uh, I'm answering the question in, in the right way for you. Um, substance is the most important thing, right? So I, I think, the people in my organization who I'm looking to get to the next level are the people who have high substance. You know, when you go, when you think back to that slide, and I think we're going to publish those slides so you have them. You know, I, I want that they have an opinion, uh, that they're able to tell me about that opinion, and they they give me good advice. Right? Those are the people who are going to make the next level. I'll come back to that guiding principle, right? The one product that you offer that I can get nowhere else is your opinion. Uh, give the advice, you know, that's how I think you make your mark. Those are the people who become your, the people you count on, the people who are making problems go away. You know, Alan said something, Alan Mulally said something interesting. He said, you know, I used to go in and think, you know, if you're going to bring a problem to you, you better have a solution to. And he said, that's really flawed. You know, that the gift is the problem, right? That people are coming to you and trust you with the thing that they may not be proud of. Um, collectively solve the problem, right? So the people who are willing to come to you are willing to step into the spotlight, have high substance, um, and our problem solvers are willing to get it engaged and think about how we could uh, solve the problem, sometimes in radical ways. Uh, those are the people who, you know, get your attention as a leader who, you know, sort of come above the, 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 the masses uh, uh, that might be in a team. Those are the people I look for. Well, I hope that helps. <laughs> you know, we're going for way over time, but I'm trying to just fit in a couple more, if that's okay, Keith. Um, we still have so many people. Give me need. one more. We'll get, we'll get Does it get a couple more, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I know. Thank you so much, everyone. There is so many questions coming in. Um, do you have any advice on approaching senior, a senior leader to give feedback on their leadership style? For example, maybe they have a blind spot in relation to some of the Gravitas values and attributes? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, if it's somebody who's uh, more senior to you, um, there is a truism in life that uh, flattery works. Like, um, you know, if, uh, many of the people that I want to get time with are really, really busy, right? 
And if they have something that I admire about them, um, I start with that, right? That, that's how I hook them into giving me some time, right? And I try to be specific about that. Um, you know, certainly it is something that has to be done delicately, I think, uh, that you have to know that they are open to hearing it. Uh, so that slide on giving feedback, you know, make sure it is private. Make sure it is done in kindness, you know, and that's sometimes how I begin, you know, uh, it, the easiest thing to do would have been to say nothing. Uh, but because I admire you, uh, because I want to get better and I know we all want to get better and I can see that in your personality. I mean, you're not going to give feedback to someone who you don't think is going to take it. Right. Uh, so, you know, be very genuine and upfront about that. Uh, I, I'm telling you because I admire you and I want you, I want to see you get better just like I want to get better. I'm going to give you a piece of feedback. I hope you would do the same to me and see it as a gift. Um, and you can see, I hope in how I said that, it, that it would be genuine and from the heart. Uh, and I think that's important, particularly, uh, and that's not necessarily because they're, they're more senior. Uh, I would hope that you would do that with, uh, with anybody, regardless of their rank, uh, those common elements of uh, treating people with respect and dignity, uh, you know, work, work at all levels in the organization, including up. Absolutely, Keith. That's good advice. Um, I think hopefully if we just squeeze one more in, I know we're completely yeah, sure. running over, but we'll, we'll no see if we can get one more. There's so many questions for everybody. Um, but Choose to Challenge is the theme of International Women's Day this year. Do you think you should always challenge no matter what? Well, um, yeah, I do, actually. And, and uh, we had an audience uh, two weeks ago with the retired uh, CEO of IBM, and she is a really interesting leader. Uh, and again, one of those people who has a very simple message. And uh, she said, progress and comfort are opposing values. Uh, that if you want comfort, you're not gonna get progress. And if you want progress, you're not gonna get comfort. So I think that uh, appropriate challenge, but yes, you know, I, I'll give you a silly technology example, but in like the 1990s, uh, when Apple came out uh, with one of the first uh, mobile phones, Nokia laughed at the fact that it didn't have any buttons. You know, they were like, this is the most ridiculous thing ever. You know, this phone doesn't have any buttons. And it was a radical change, right? And, um, you know, you saw so many like Motorola, they don't make many phones anymore. Uh, they didn't adapt. They didn't. They didn't challenge their thinking uh, when it came to oh, that big jump in technology. So, I, I like the radical thinker for a lot of reasons. I think we should challenge. You know, even if you don't go with the radical solution, it helps you narrow down the possible solutions, right? So sometimes you need to, as a leader, throw out the most radical solution so you can rule it out and then begin getting closer to what the actual solution is. So absolutely, I, I do believe in, in the power of challenge because uh, comfort and progress are opposing values. Uh, clearly it was uncomfortable to move outside the United States. Clearly it was uncomfortable to work in an environment uh, where I was challenged technically. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that those indeed are opposing values and have been in my career. Fantastic, Keith. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we're completely over time. And there was so there's so many questions. I'm sorry, I just couldn't get through everybody here, but there is so many. Oh, I don't know. Can we meet your daughter just before we go? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if she's around. Portia. Who's asking there? <laughs> oh, let's see her. Is I she think there? she's out of earshot. <laughs> she must be downstairs. Oh. She should be doing some homework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. It is. It's, it's homeschooling skills. In. I know, oh, I wish she was here. She would have loved <laughs> to see it. <laughs> see everyone. But we had had so many. I'm so sorry we couldn't get through all the questions, but we're just really conscious of, of the time here, Kate. But thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it on behalf of Women in Business for taking the time. Um, some excellent, excellent um, advice there that we've received. Really, from my end, it was learning how to get your values and, you know, make sure that you have those in place, have big, good listening skills and everything. I really appreciate that because I think we do. Somebody said to me recently, like, you communicate to respond so quickly these days we don't communicate to listen 
So it's really, you know, from, from my end, you know, that was a really good insight there. Um, but I will be looking at people's feet to see what way their direction their shoes are. <laughs> <laughs> are they looking to escape or are they engaged? Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> but again, thank you so much, Kate. We will, of course, um, be actually recording this. So hopefully we might be able to get it up onto our Women in Business webinar web page also. So if anybody's missed anything, um, I'm sure they would love to um, come back and have a look at it. And um, we're getting so many thanks, Keith, here that's popping oh, in. You. So I can't keep up with everybody, but it is really great to see the positive feedback from today. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who for joining us today. We hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Th thanks for having me. Take care.